Well, the first one went well. We're underway. Only another 287,000 to go. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Talking About. We're talking about season one, episode two. And this is, well, I won't do the title. Oh, yeah, because that would just be well in advance of what they wanted, yeah. Don't forget to like, subscribe, notify, subscribe, alert, all that stuff, and write things below. Yeah. I'm Paul Opibel, and I'm joined by... Hello, it's James. And hello, it's Jason. <laughs> so which one of you is cosplaying as the last human that survived centuries of, of time? <laughs> Jason. <laughs> Do you know what? I wondered how long it would be before we got all these old jokes there about me looking like as old as time and all of that sort of thing. Um, but I think it's rude. But I think James has excelled himself here. <laughs> I still what? think it looks a little bit like the Teletubby son. That's, that's all I'm going to say. Uh-oh. <laughs> More, more uh-oh than uh -oh, I think. <laughs> anyway, um, last week on the Talking About, or the week before, depending on when this goes out, we awarded Doctor Who and the Rose 20 points out of a possible 30, that is, folks. Probably not a season winner. Um, well, we move sw swiftly, so swiftly on to Doctor Who and the End of the World. Now, that is an and title, isn't it? Doctor Who in an exciting adventure and the end of the world. No. Um, who's starting this one off, then? Well, I'll have a go at this one. And you almost expect Salamander to pop up here, don't you? Because it's sort of very close to the enemy of the world. No. No, no literally, no. I don't think anyone in the <laughs> world for that, Jason. Maybe well, maybe that's just me. Okay, uh... <laughs> So with, what episode did you watch? I, I probably watched The Enemy of the World. <laughs> so was, was, was this on your notes? Or was this, no, this when you said you got to get your notes, notes ready? No, no, no. I just threw an ad lib in there. It didn't work. Hopefully the edit will take care of that for us. Um, the End of the World, we're into the second episode of this new season. Um, and it already feels, no, it doesn't feel like a long season at all. Looking forward to this. Um, end of the world. So we um, get out into space and um, the adventure starts for us. So if we take um, Rose as being almost like the pilot, as, as Pibal said in the previous uh, recording, um, we are into sort of Rose now experiencing um, some time with the Doctor. I think when I look at this, this acts as almost the second um, sort of introduction to the series because now we've sort of established um, a modern day sort of current uh, new Doctor Who. And now we've taken it off world. We're on platform one. Um, we're, we're right at the further, we're five billion years in the future. Um, the Earth is about to get destroyed and the Doctor's going to show Rose a little bit of what time travel is about. However, what this does do quite well, I think, and, and helps the format massively, is that um, it, we're now introducing the new viewers, because bearing in mind, not all just sort of classic Doctor Who fans who are tuning in to watch this. Um, we're now introducing the new viewer to the concept of what happens when um, a companion travels with the Doctor. They see new things, they get involved in the adventures, and where we had an established alien to get us going in rows, um, what you end up with here is a, a motley collection of various alien delegates. Um, now, this could help James's score because he's a big fan of the master plan. So alien delegates are back here on platform. Oh, sorry, one. Is, is, is the monk in this one? No. No. Um, and, of course, we get introduced to um, one of... Um, the campist characters for me, um, uh, James. No, um, Cassandra. So, um, <laughs> so I think this is a is, this continues to build on the introduction, really, and and in some ways the sort of introduction lasts for the first sort of three stories um, for me in this season. But this is this is establishing now time travel, different monsters, and uh, companion traveling with the Doctor for the first time. What I love is that Jason established that 
since like the second episode of the season. It's like the second. <laughs> that was one of the keystones like the of that intro. This is like the second introduction episode, like the second part of the season. But it's what you expect from me. I'm only playing to the form that you expect. It's Doctor Who and it's a very exciting adventure in space it is. Oh, well, dear. I think that actually was quite offensive, that accent. <laughs> I do it, it's People offensive. Writing. I do it, it's offensive. You do it, it's not offensive. I think that was cultural appropriation. I uh, should apologise to the viewer, but okay. We'll move on. <laughs> oh, God, we've got I mean, a yeah, good they, start here. I um, mean, essentially, most of the CGI budget is used here because I, I think, I remember watching a interview with Russell T Davis where he was like I wanted to show you know every type of alien really it's like you know we started on earth contemporary earth it was all about the family and you know there was a sideline adventure but here you are thrown in at the deep end the earth is about to to explode and you've got a whole array of different like you say aliens for a new viewer I mean some of them you never see again, you know, but it is all about the the spectacle of, you know, here's a blue alien, here's a stretchy, bitchy trampoline, here's a, you know, uh, um, here's the, the, the face of Bo is in this one, who obviously does um, feature later on, but you've got the mocks of Balhoon and all of these. And, it, and again, if you're thinking about merch and you were just talking about, um, you know, Toys R Us, after this, by the time we got to the end of the first series, was full of all the toys. Quite a lot of them were from this episode. <laughs> you know, I mean, there was there was several different versions of Cassandra. One that didn't have a face in it. You know, one which was like Cassandra's face that had blown up. Oh, to, to be fair, to be fair, the, the the destroyed Lady Cassandra from New Earth did did come quite a way down the line. They, they didn't plot that as their their opening gambit. I, I think we've got to be be fair on when we say that, but yeah, you do you do get um, a Jabe, don't you, and a, and a, and a Moxa Balhoon and uh, Lady Cassandra intact, intact. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, you know, the the premise of the story. I mean, it's quite. Um, I think people you mentioned on the last uh, review about the manipulation of the Doctor. It's your first date with the Doctor, effectively, and he takes you to the destruction of your your home planet, which I think is in, in, in some sort of twisted way, bearing in mind what's happened to his home planet, and um, we're still, you know, that sort of still trickling through, and we find out a bit more in this story. To take a human to the destruction of Earth in the far future is quite, I don't know, I think that's quite a almost twisted thing to do. And he... And there are points in this episode where he he goads her. You know, she, she has this realization that actually she just jumped on board the TARDIS with a complete stranger, and now she finds herself in the far future, surrounded by aliens. And you know, there's that moment where she's like, "Did I did I make a mistake?" And he's like, "You know, well, I'll take you home then." You know, it, it, it's he does he he is quite i don't know it's, it's very subtle but i think he is quite mean to her at some points in, in this episode um but then they, they do have the the sort of sparky moments um where he's where she's like you know when he, when he goes off with jabe and she makes a comment about it and, and again you get the humor that comes through in this episode there's um Cassandra saying about the the jukebox is an eye player and you know the, the sort of classic classical music which is for us contemporary music it, it's there's there are some there are points in this um which are you know again designed for I think the younger viewer to to sort of connect to um but yeah it, it's it's essentially just a a straightforward Doctor Who story there's a peril and the Doctor's got to stop it so we've in the last story we didn't really see the Doctor do a great deal because we sort of joined him mid-adventure now we see through Rose's eyes the Doctor turns up somewhere 
gets involved and then suddenly there's a danger that he has to to try and work out and it's a bit of a sort of scooby doo story isn't it because he's not sure who the you know who is the the person behind it so you know it's a kind of a bit of a fun romp if you like but nothing too heavy or serious I suppose it's a nice subversion because Rose already at the start when he's like, it's the day, you know, this is the end of the world. And she's like, what do we do? Do we, do we get down there and save? And he's like, no, no, this is it. It's mm. done. I suppose that's the first proper subversion of that. Um, but I suppose it, it, it's, it's showing the, the spectrum of the imagination. It, 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 is, it is the culture shock of the aliens that, that's, that's the selling point on this, isn't mm. it? Um, which it works. And doesn't work in equal measure, I think, with hindsight. I mean, hindsight's amazing. With the Disney billions, they'll be fine. But I mean, essentially, the, the face of Bo looks incredible. I love that big ass yeah. prop. And that was, that looked great in the exhibitions, all that stuff. Face of Bo looks great. And Jabe, the, the tree, the tree makeup and all that stuff looks really good. Mox um, about But there are a couple of background monsters that, mm have sort of very much been, <laughs> been sort of, they're, they're, they're stand a bit further to the back because they are a little bit hokier. And it's, a, it, it's, not, it's not a criticism because I, I get that, that when you say, can we have, you know, a dozen different alien creatures, please, for this? And, you know, mm -hmm. there's no money and can we have it tomorrow? I get that that's, that's going to happen. But it's interesting that even when it comes to the new stuff, there's, it's still fighting the limitations of the budget and the time, which you you kind of think, well, in 1968 when they were doing that, it's it, it, it was just it wasn't underappreciated. Whereas it's still it's still sort of part of the parcel of, of of how it was being made, even coming back into it, that they didn't have the money to match necessarily the imagination they were driving towards. It fails. Mm -hmm. It's just there are a couple of those those monsters. It's a hot pileen or something like that, the way where you, yeah. <laughs> you make up it. Okay. They were all on the trading cards, weren't they? There was, there was all the different, because you got the trading card and went, what, what's this sort of bird-like thing? And it was like, it was one of the characters from this episode that you saw for about five seconds. But within that context, um, I love that little bit with Raffalo, uh, mm. Becky Armory. There's an, a lovely performance mm. for, for literally two scenes because she has the little scene yeah. one and the scene with Rose. She, she's it, it's a tiny part in some ways yeah a huge part in others because you know you know her world and again it comes back to what we were saying with rose and clive and all that sort of stuff is that that she's a very incidental character but if you said this is the character i'm talking about from this episode you'd be like oh yeah, the little yeah. the the the, the woman who's doing the, the the plumbing who gets killed by you'd know what people were talking about and you care when she gets I mean, she's quite brutal, I suppose, little spider thing. Mm. Don't quite know what they do to kill people, but there's quite a screen there. Um, but again, it's, it is that just that little little nod, and you, you could be a guest part, and still, actually, it has an impact. So I think that's, that's, again, an early example of the power of this, really. And then you've got the link back, because he sort of fixes her mobile phone so she can phone home. So you, you've again got that reinforcement of the family the, the um, nokia 3310 <laughs> that I know. modern classic phone of all times how far we've come and how much we want that battery life still <laughs> but <laughs> it never needed to be charged um but again you've got that you know very clever link back that she now is able to speak to her wherever she is she can speak to her mum so she, you know again you know the doctor sort of reassuring her to say it's okay you know you've got that connection um and that's something that crops up in other stories as well where there's the sort of like reaching out to to jackie just to sort of really sort of touch base make sure that she's aware of where she is or what's happening well, you know I think that's that really telephone cool. call comes it's before she's left, isn't it? The, she, she, mm. the, it, it, it's, it's because there was a lot of debate, wasn't it, about when does when does that telephone call come? Because when she goes back to Earth, and she hasn't heard anything from her. She's like, "What's it cost to make a phone yeah. call?" So for Rose, that's a phone call, uh, and, and it's, it's not quite part of the storyline as to explain when it's meant to be. But 
clearly yeah. from Jackie's perspective, it must be before Rose has gone because she thinks Rose is at She's staying out for the night. Yeah, she thinks yeah. she's staying yeah. with a friend, doesn't she? And she mentions the lottery, so it's kind of, yeah. Um, yeah. And she would know, obviously, that um, that wasn't happening after the department store's been blown up, of course. Mm. They still had the lottery, I think. Oh, the lottery <laughs> still happened, yes. Yes. <laughs> Dale Winton was still presenting back in the day, I think, wasn't he? It was probably was indeed in that era. Probably still got the singers and all sorts and proper charts and oh, it was a golden age. It was a golden age and we didn't appreciate it. I know. Um, I do love Yasmin Bannerman's performance in this. I think she's 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 kind of uh, she's got a lovely sort of flirtatious edge when she's playing it. I I, I like that. It's 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 somehow it's sort of flirtatious without being over sexualized, which is an mm. odd thing to say, but. There's a, there's a real sort of thing there between her and the Doctor that, that's, that's sort of mm. beautifully underpaid. And, and also, it's the first... Um, I suppose you get that inference of, of, of you know, the time or the last of the time. The last of the, the time, not. And that, yeah. that's, that's sort of brought in when, when, when she's, you know, working out who he is. And that's, it's sort of adding to the mythology without having 1,400 big finished box sets to cover it. It's just you <laughs> patch in behind start to build your own story for it. You know what I mean? Um, I mean, the, the hilarious, I mean, it's quite brutal the way that she, she's killed off. I mean, this series is not afraid to, when she, she does the, the, she burns alive, doesn't she? she she's yeah. wood. Yeah. Um, and she knows she's going to die. I mean, it's a sort of, it's a running theme in, in the thing of people knowingly sacrificing themselves because we get that again next week and we get that again in a couple of weeks mm. time from that so it's quite a running theme of people knowingly killing themselves for for tv's doctor who um didn't she reappear later on in one of the flashbacks about all the people that the doctors failed to save i'm sure she is uh, one of the flashback sequences i think with davros and i think they they showed that um, scene again where she burnt up because it's quite, you're right, it's quite a horrific scene. Well, the, the stations, the state, and again, it's a bit, you know, you, you do these Indiana Jones moments because it's good for the drama, but the, the swinging things to stop you from getting <laughs> to, the, to the reset button is like, who, who in this, this era of humanity thought we won't just have it? At the end of a corridor in a room, we'll have it on a gantry that you've got to balance along and swinging, swinging sort of blades to stop anyone doing it. It's like, no, they were getting they were getting ready for the for the possibility of a Doctor Who video game at the time. That would have been one of the set pieces in the video game, wouldn't it? <laughs> Quite yeah. possible. But it does add to the. Ten I love the moment of stillness where he just stops and. And then he just takes a step forward and, and he's through. I think that's a lovely, mm. a lovely moment. Um, and it's not really the, something that they ever go back to or talk mm. about. I think not until you get to sort of Capaldi era when he's talking about his mind and how he processes things. Mm. I think it's a lovely sort of snapshot of him just like, I will, you know, I'm going to take my moment and I'm going to step forward. I think that's really nice with all the sort of things that are going on around him, that he has that ability to just shut off and, and do it. He, but he also knows that he's got to do it as well. Yeah. And you get that nice little under under play of the music that comes up underneath it as well. It's a really nice, subtle use of incidental to just reinforce, I think, what we were seeing on screen. Mm. So what, what would we think of the Lady Cassandra thing? I could, and, and, and so you want to make, or is it so you want to make, Zoe Wanamaker obviously a really good name mm. to be in it as well, early doors. And obviously you can announce that she's in it and then she, she is, but she <laughs> isn't, isn't she, in some ways? I think it's a brilliant character. And I I, I, I mean, I know we, we get a second outing where I think actually I would say I find her even better in the second one. But I think in, in this one, there are, there's these wonderful moments, particularly against Rose, where they're sort of like, you know, where she says, I'm I'm human and, and ex you know, there's, there's wonderful sort of like throwaway lines as well. Um, I, I just think it's a really sort of nice, mischievous kind of character. And, and you, I remember sort of watching this going, it's obviously the uh, repeated meme 
peoples that are the bad guys because they're all dressed in black and they've got massive claw hands and you know they're the ones that gave the spiders out and and you're so sort of thrown off and then you've got cassandra who's sort of like being nice and jovial and sort of like look at all these wonderful things i brought from earth but then when she is revealed as the as the villain the doctor is actually really quite harsh it's just, you know just lets her dry out and thinks that she's she's dead he's just like you know no you you've caused all this death and i'm not going to help you but if you think about what he's seen through the time war and obviously we mm. don't know that just yet and this all becomes part of the narrative further on down the line but it the time war clearly has hardened him and that's mm. why he's prepared to do that i mean cassandra as a character is that sort of wonderfully camp almost joan collins-esque approach here she's she's clearly the villain but she's doing it so well i mean obviously i appreciate that you know you don't see zo zoe want to make her on screen but she's channeling through um the character there and i there's a definite camp sort of almost bitch here she's she's the bitch mm. of this season well it's an important morality with the character though isn't it because when when she describes herself as the last human and rose that well, what happened to everyone else she's like well they spread out they bred with her so it's that kind of interesting thing that actually she isn't the last human she's what she's perceiving to be the last human because she's the last one who hasn't integrated with other other cultures and hasn't moved on from what yeah. she was. and yet at the same time she's also isn't any form of human because she's stretched herself out beyond what so it's the paradox of these sort of i suppose of these people a sort of mindset of a mm. certain type of person and 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 the paradoxes that come with that so it's it's, it's only a sort of small scene with rose but it's a very sort of important thing because it's very much the morality of the show but without sort of going this is what you should be thinking. It, it doesn't actually say that she's a bad person for it, because in some ways she should be pitied for putting herself through all that horror and becoming a grotesque for her standpoint on how she thinks the world should be. Mm. So it, it, it's, a, it's an interesting sort of moral play out, I think, as a character. Mm. I'll stun them into silence Ooh. with like a sound <laughs> breakdown. It's true. I mean, she thinks she's pure, doesn't she? She says, I'm the last pure human. And it's not, you know, through Rose's eyes, that's nothing, there's, there's no humanity left there. She doesn't look anything remotely human. So it is it is an interest. I mean, uh, I think Russell T. Davis based it on like Hollywood actresses and, and you know, he got the inspiration from seeing people uh, at award ceremonies that were literally like stretched and, you know, I had so much work done that they were barely recognisable from, you know, from their heyday. But that that's something that still happens today. But that for me is part of the is part of the enjoyment of Russell's writing and the way that um, he perceives certain things and goes for slightly left field sort of approaches. And it's not we don't we just not we're not presented with the norm here. We're presented with abstract views or or some kind of off the wall sort of approach but it's done it's not it's not done in a it's not done in a way that's 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 um it can come across if things are done badly they come across as obviously quite forced the way that russell writes it's it's clever and it's it's there for a reason and it counts and i i i think um it makes it almost a little bit more authentic within the story mm. but interesting the choice has been made as well this week to not have Doctor Who and Rose together throughout. They they are there are quite a few chunks of time where they're separate. And I suppose that gives Rose the, the space to be like, what is this? What have I, you know? Um and then I I guess Jabe then sort of steps up as being the pseudo companion role and, and doing the sort of scenes that you ordinarily expect Rose to be doing. Um but it is an interesting way of of, of splitting the plot up again. Um, it allows us, it's allowing us, I think, to get to know both of the characters because he's, I mean, even the doctor is new to us at, at this point. So we're seeing those sort of different dynamics coming out at play. And, you know, Rose is put into peril. I mean, you know, she's in the, she's trapped in that room, for example, and the, and the, 
and the sun rays are going to come in and they're going to burn her and all of that sort of thing. Um, but it sets up that traditional, again, this comes down to, I think, the way Russell's looking at the programme because he's because I think he's got a very classic Doctor Who approach at times as well. Mm -hmm. And that splitting of the companions and putting them both in that sort of peril, it it does hark back massively to, to you know, some of, the, some of the early Doctor Who stories, particularly that sort of Sarah... Um, uh, doctor Tom Baker doctor sort of um, relationship where they would get separated and be in their own little you know so I I just think it's a night nice, here for sure there is no there's no getting around the fact that I think he absolutely gets Doctor Who in ways that some of the other showrunners that have followed haven't yeah, and I and again I sort of I, I'd sort of reiterate there that the the, the morality and, and Doctor Who is I mean, I think when people get upset about Doctor Who being PC or having strong moral sort of elements, it has always, literally always had that. It's just a question of how it's packaged and fed. And and if it rises naturally and, and is just part of the dialogue or part of the plot, then you don't feel that someone's saying you know, the He-Man turned to camera, kids, this is your moral of the week, remember this, because then you go, oh, seriously, I'm not six, I'm okay. Yeah. Whereas if it's part of it and you're you're asking yourself questions about, is that person good? Is that? I mean, the, the morality in this is all, you know, there's different parts, aren't there? I mean, um, Cassandra's obviously killed a lot of people because of her, her, her selfishness us to, to want to be the last human, to be the celebrity for the fame and the, all that, and the adoration that she wants. Um, Doctor Who relies on Jay basically sacrificing herself, but she willingly sacrifices herself because she's like, I'm wood, I'll burn, I know, just just hurry up. Um, when when he then allows Lady Cassandra to explode and won't help her, Rose is like, help her. And he's like, nah. And she, mm -hmm. you know, so th th there's morals everywhere. And I suppose in some ways, even though he's an alien, you're already seeing the point that... that Rose is the one that's got to give him the the humanity back, I suppose. And, and yeah, because in, in the first episode, when with the Autons, he was really trying to save them. It, it was like the last resort was using the antiplastic. He was, he was, you know, he was sort of saying to it to them that I will help you find some some other planet, etc. But here, when he realizes that it is Cassandra who's set this whole thing up, he is ruthless in. You know, there's no big speech or anything. It's just like, right, that's it. Uh, you know, you're pretty much, I'm going to watch you die now because of what you have done. Um, you know, and he does the whole sort of Scooby-Doo reveal where he sort of, sort of says to the spy, you know, the metallic spider thing, you know, go back to um, your boss. But then there is that, darkness and you know and and you'll see this more later on in the series of the time war and what damage it has done to him and rose is still in this story because it's jabe that that recognizes the doctor as a time lord we're seeing it through jabe's eyes not roses and then when rose tries to ask questions about it he gets really defensive he's like i you know i don't want to talk about it and, and eventually he tells her a little bit so we're still getting this drip feed of the things that have happened to him before he met Rose um, but he's still trying to protect her from that but I like that we, I, I wouldn't want the whole the whole thing spilled out here and delivered to me in episode two of the season I, I want this to to build and it the, the other stories that follow will allow that story to be told naturally to the point where it obviously gets you know obviously gets more revealed but it's clear that the way that this is now being played is that the doctor as a character is suffering the effects of what has happened he is now the only time lord as far as he's concerned he's the last of his race you know and there's going to be survivor's guilt in here there's going to be all sorts of emotions that the doctor's playing with and therefore, he's not going to be prepared to reveal that at this stage uh, to um, Rose, because he's he's almost to a way you almost feel like Rose is going to now give him that sort of energy and that confidence to sort of move forward as well. So they're as much they both need each other for completely different reasons. 
Mm. Yeah. 17 years on, what do we know about Susan, Romana, and the Rani? <laughs> what, 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 what became of them? Don't, if anyone says in Gallifrey box at 423, this is what happens, I will scream down the internet at you. But <laughs> there's, never been, there's never been a dress who had the mask the back, obviously, that he didn't notice was still around and all that sort of stuff. And, and Russ, we had a few time all comebacks, haven't we, back and forth. But it was very much the intention, I think, at this point, that, that it was underlined, wasn't it? This is Doctor Who, he's on his own. Because mm. Russell, I don't know, again, I, mean, I suppose it's a conversational cul-de-sac, but I think Russell's initial thought was that he didn't want the guys okay. with the collars, mm. into, he didn't want that set up and, the, and Doctor Who being out and about and called back and so he was trying to have a time lord, I suppose. He, he wanted to cut mm. all that sort of baggage. Um, which is interesting because because it was it was very much you keep the TARDIS box, the police box, and that so you keep certain elements, but cut away as much as possible from the past. And it's it, it, I don't know whether there's there must be charts on the internet. So how incrementally season on season as it's rolled, how many more things have been brought back or pulled into it or added to the mixture, and all of a sudden, mm. all of a sudden. It ended up, and I'm not being horrible, I'm genuinely not just being horrible on the new series here, but from from Rose and where we're at here, the end of the world, where it's just like, he's on his own, that's it, a man in a box, and I, to Power of the Doctor, where he's <laughs> popped back to Earth, and he's, he's talking about the Brigadier, and, and he's got, got Ace and Tegan, and blah, blah, blah. and you, you know, where all of a sudden, this, 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 it's expanded up into that. Um, it's an interesting progression in some ways. Mm. I don't you know if it's a healthy progression. No, you particularly when you that. Oh, sorry, go on. I was going to say, particularly when you consider that I remember the pitch that Chris was putting forward for um, his his version of what Doctor Who was going to be, and he wasn't at all going to rely on any of the old characters, any of the old things that had gone before. Yet, quite quickly, you know, we had that sort of nice bits with Rosa Parks and all those sorts of things, but it very quickly fell back into that whole treadmill of Daleks and Cybermen and then regenerating Cybermen and all of that. Whereas I think we've got, I think there's a freshness now in the way that it it's being presented by Russell at this stage, obviously early doors, but you know, it's clear he's going to have to reference the past, but it's done in such a, I think it's done in such a clever and intelligent way it's refreshing to go back and see these now compared to, I think, some of the sledgehammering of what we've had in recent years mm. um, going on, which I think Ooh, don't, don't get me wrong. Under, under Russell T. Davis, we get some pretty sledgehammering later on. I think there's an overuse of some of those those things. No, I'm not. But, I'm not saying. I'm not oh. saying it's. I'm not saying he's perfect. What, oh, no, no, no. But what I'm saying is, you know, if you think about what he manages to achieve by bringing the program back in the way that it's brought back. Yeah, oh, I, I'm trying I, to agree. I think there is a wonderful slow build to this series where, where you're right, it doesn't go, oh, you know, we've got a 45 year old history, a 50 year history. We've got to bring it all in straight away because it doesn't and it takes its time, you know, even beyond the first series to reintroduce certain elements to to the show you know and but and did you not think though that that like russell eve even coming to the season what he only did the cyberman and the daleks for doomsday he only combined those once and, and the Daleks with sort of one of, i think he, i think he was incredibly metered with how he used those sort of elements whereas in recent ones, it's like the Daleks and the Cybermen and the Santarans are on a little Snapchat group and hang <laughs> out together. I mean, it 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 was it was a big deal having the two of them together. And and then now mm. it's just like, oh, just down the down down the arcade with the mates, the Cybermen. It's just like, oh, sh- surely there's they've got to have their own little individual identities now. <laughs> now they're watching the master dance as as mad monk Rasputin. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean it's on one hand, it, it's funny. On the other hand, mm. it's like that's what it's become, and 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 and, and it, it, I hope, you know, that that it'll be a new take on the show that we get going forward. I mean, this is mm. a huge diver, but I'd like to think it's got the same skeleton of this mm. that it 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 meters how much it wants to use from the past, yeah, and and how much it relies on 
people having watched 16 years of something or you know and I, and I I would just like to see that little break where actually it's a story and we don't have to have the weeping angels back again and work out where in their chronology it comes we don't have to have 100 years of backstory of the master if the master turns up i mean you think when the master used to turn up he would just turn up that week and it would just be he would be part of the story whereas progressively with these things it's all been a bit like well the time before when this happened this happened and this happened and now he's this and like, oh. yeah and I, again to bring it back to the point i spoke <laughs> is it episode two series one here everything is still fresh and, and, and yeah. the reset is very much mm. working i think because because if you if you're a viewer on bbc one watching this you are not sat there going hang on so where do i know why why should i know cassandra's this or that and I go bringing about the year after, there's a huge chance that you'd understand. If you didn't understand, I think it works without it. But I think you, if you'd seen the year before, you're rewarded that this is a returning character rather than it being like, why do I know who the Dolcians are or something? Do you, do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I know exactly. Yeah, I do know what you mean. I think there is a, I mean, the way that this series is structured and the, the, the different stories, you know, we, the next one is another one completely different where we see a different another element of life with the doctor i think it's very well done so that you can introduce someone who doesn't know anything to the show anything of the you know the history of the show can just watch it and enjoy it and if you're a fan of the show <clears throat> there are occasionally little nods and tweaks and things where you just go oh yeah that might be xyz but you don't need to it's not you know couple of series down the line and we'll be into timey wimey really confusing stuff where we're having to like you say work out which which plot line this fits into here it's blissful because it's there's nothing there's nothing complicated um you know it is just a romp in space that's it that's that's the simply it that's what i would have started with it's a oh, in space. I think Jason did a very good introduction. It was the pinnacle of introductions that he's done so far. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sure I can peek yet. Don't worry, I'm there. <laughs> anyway, do we have any exotic facts from the dark web about Doctor Who and the end of the world? Uh, just having a look. It's the first intro, I think, to the psychic paper. I don't think he used it in the first episode. Mm -hmm. So it's the first time that that has appeared. Um, it's the first mention yeah. of Bad Wolf as well in this, isn't it? It's the first it, mention of Bad Wolf. Yeah, it's not mentioned in um, Rose. In Rose, yeah. This one, it's the Bad Wolf scenario, isn't it? Or Yes, it's, it's the bad. It's the mock the Balhoun that says it. And he, mm. he says, "Oh, this is the bad wolf scenario, or something like that." Um, and again, he doesn't say the time. He doesn't say the time war. He just says it, my people were killed in a war. Um, in there was a there was a deleted scene where Ray um, Rabe's scanner was going to show the doctors having two forms of dna but that was that was taken out um but yeah that was it that was all i had that we haven't already discussed it's funny because i think that end scene that end sort of uh, it's not it's not quite a moral the last scene with um, chris um as well in, in the street where he's talking to rose saying you know you, you're all obsessed with the end of, and it kind of resonated even stronger i think because we've had so many years now where we've had Brexit, or we've had a pandemic, or we've had, that. And, and and I think the news and our culture has sort of adjusted to the next end of the world. I'm not saying things mm. don't impact. I'm not saying that they don't have actual effects, but we have honestly, I think, had several years of everything news-wise heading towards this is the end of the world. This thing's happened. This is the end of the world. And it, it's interesting because I, I just thought that, that that end monologue really resonated. It's like you're so mm. concerned with the end of the world, you don't just realise that life just goes on and it will keep going on. And it's rather, that's quite a, a prescient thing. And it, and it doesn't feel shoehorned in either. Again, you know, I think the way it's written in, it's 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 almost closing off another period of the sort of it, almost the intro, but the words are wise. And it, it again, just shows, I think, 
that that one scene shows again how I think how dependent they're going to become on each other, but how well they're going to perform this together as well. And mm-hmm. uh, and, uh, and you know it it fits perfectly into the um, into the, into the episode as it plays out. Um, I also think this this is the first time we will have seen it, and it'll happen a number of times where you intermix um, modern music. Um, into an episode and it works really, really well um, where you've sort of got those records that play and you've got it spun out with that music and the, and, the, and the effect shots and things. I think that works really, really well from a production perspective. Toxic was a very modern song at that point. Mm. Yeah, it's very popular, popular music. Soft sell a little bit less so, but yeah, Britney Jean Spears. Wait, were you was in the little quite... Christopher Eccleston head bop? <laughs> <laughs> He can't get the camera back for his head bump. He's just doing that. No, I, I mean, they all know I'm going to be doing the old head bump, don't they? They know I'm going to do it. The viewer... Again, that's another one of those moments where I go, oh, Christopher oh. can't do kooky. It's, it's a bit <laughs> awkward. Is he, but is he doing that on... But is he doing that on purpose? What? Mm. Acting awkwardly? Yeah. As in acting awkwardly, awkwardly. He's acting awkwardly <laughs> at acting awkwardly. Is that what you... Possibly. <laughs> I don't know. Could be. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that's true. Although I do have to worry because, I mean, bless, the majority of these, when they're, they're like in London and it's Cardiff Central, but mm. the notion that she wants to go get chips, does that mean she's dragging him off down Wine Street? I don't know. That's a, that's a nice <laughs> thought, is it, for Doctor Who? Uh, Caroline Street. No, well, Wine Street, where they all get drunk and... Show off the kebabs. Uh, that's yeah. Chip, that's um, Caroline Street in, in Cardiff. It's, Jason, it's Wine it? Street in um, Swansea. Oh, uh, I'm mixing bogs. Yeah, you are. <laughs> well, they're both pretty horrific. Hi. <laughs> no, this is. Oh, no, no, no. We're on own time. So, so hang on, hang on. So you're saying when people are 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 um, hideously drunk, stumbling about, shouting and grabbing kebabs and and stuff like that. That's not horrific. I'm normally pretty drunk uh, and grabbing the kebabs uh, myself, if I'm honest, at that time <laughs> of the evening, so I never notice it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if the answer to, to, if you say, what would Penelope Keith do? And the answer is she wouldn't do it. That's your moral standpoint. I consider my moral compass well and truly told off there. I think it's peaked. I think you peaked a long time ago. <laughs> Do you know, I'm trying to avoid using it. And already we're two episodes into this season and it's it's going to become a thing again. It's, yes. It's, oh. <laughs> so we have peaked. Um, do we have some summaries and scores? Yeah, I'll go. I'll go first. So, yeah, I described it as a romp in space. And it, and it is. It's like a Scooby-Doo adventure in space. It's like... Who done it? Who you know? Who was the one behind the the sabotage? I think it's very, it's really weird watching it now compared to watching it when it went out. Because when it went out, it was like all CGI. It was like they they really spent some money on the episode. It was all about grabbing the intention of people. And then watch it back now, and what you said earlier on about some of the background characters, it is really obvious. <laughs> some of, some of the CGI. I don't think has, 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 you know, fared well over the years. And I, and I, I find it quite sort of like, uh, what's the word? It's, it's a bit much in some parts of all the CGI. And it's just like, actually, probably didn't need all of that. Um, I think the character of Cassandra is really good. I like her. I like this, the, um, uh, the steward. The, the blue guy as well. He, you know, I think again, he's one of those characters. He's, he, you feel for him because he's he's trying to get everything together, and then you know the sabotage uh, starts. I love the scene with Rose and um, the lady. You know, there's a there's a real sort of hint of class there where where she says, you know, most people don't give me permission to speak. So there's you know, even in the far far future, there is still a class system. That uh, that's been picked up there. Overall, though, it is a bit of froth. Um, so I scored it a six. 
because there are far better episodes. But it, you know, it's it's, it's good to watch. Good to have. Good mm. to have indeed. Yes. Um, that's a great summary. Um, and froth is is actually a good starting point for me because it is a little bit of froth. Um, but what it's what it's doing, I think, is it's it's continuing to establish um the direction, continuing to establish the building of the relationship between the doctor and Rose. Um and it's clear it's clear i think that when the series came back they 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 were doing this on a bit of a budget so this isn't this isn't grand this isn't massive you know mega bucks here you know the explosions and the the effects aren't brilliant and some of the sets are a little bit basic and so on and so forth and of course they've run out of money before they can get to all the aliens but the ambition is clearly there and as I said, this this acts continues to act as a a, a nice introduction, um, and I see the next episode as well, and we'll talk about that in the next in the next recording. I see that actually still as part of the introduction because essentially we've taken modern day, we swing right to the future, we swing right to the past. So, from an establishing perspective, works well for me again. But you're right, it is a bit of froth. There isn't a huge amount of depth in here um i think we've acknowledged we like that closing scene um where i think it just wraps up and just brings the the episode to a, a close um and this i, I like the uh, the use of incidental in in this one particularly um in that sort of dramatic scene when the doctor is running through um the big massive fans um in the set piece for the episode which you know is clearly a little bit of a, a bit of a pad filler um but uh i i i'm going to actually agree with james on my score again the temptation to go a half up a half down is is there but we're not going to play those games um i actually agree and i think this is not as good as our opener um and there are better episodes in in this season so i will be going in um with a very simple six I honestly thought we were cruising for a 10 there. I thought I got the signs of that. I could see the 10 paddle coming out. I didn't use the word peak or pinnacle in there at all. No. The sign is there. If I say peak or pinnacle, hold on to your hats. <laughs> I, I seem to remember at the time, this one was less well regarded than, than a lot of the ones around it. I, I, I do remember fans weren't overly thrilled by it and it was always one that I liked more than a lot of the others around it at the time which um maybe that just doesn't matter me being young and, and happy possibly it gives us that out of you were in outer space rather than the was there a little bit of that that you were actually off no, I, was in, I was in god manchester on a sofa eating roses watching it. <laughs> oh there we are then anyway um uh, he said um so I think I actually still I mean I still don't think I don't think it's as good as I remember it being in some ways, but I still think I prefer it to Rose, but not massively more than I prefer Rose, which means in a bizarre inversion here, I've gone I'm half up on both of you. So I have the six Ooh. and a half. So I'm up on Rose, but still down on your Rose. <laughs> that makes that makes some sense. But it does mean that Doctor Who and the end of the world finishes on eighteen and a half. Which means it is in second. It's the second. It's our second episode. It is in second place. Now, can I just <laughs> say something about cultural misrepresentation here in some way? <laughs> I love how you've already set yourself up for the next one because you were like, and, and by the time we get to the third episode, it's like it's the <laughs> third episode. <laughs> This is like the third introduction to the series. <laughs> oh, do you know what? I'll get to episode 12. It's like the 12th episode. <laughs> introduction to the new series. I like that your Welsh accent sounds less Welsh than a Welsh accent. <laughs> <laughs> How is that even possible? It's a new thing I'm trying out for this season. <laughs> uh, do you know, I don't think Nick Briggs is going to be quaking here. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh my wait, days wait for the new welsh dalek <laughs> <laughs> oh exterminate 
Come on. <laughs> right. And just just for the record, I did live in Wales for a number of years, and I, and I love it, and I love everything about Wales. And I still live here. <laughs> oh, don't you mean still? You've just gone back there. No, I don't have not do just still. gone back here at all. Don't do I still. Am, you I, you were out of there a long time, no, matey. You, don't I, you go all Mary Hopkin on us. We know you've been around. I was born and bred here in Wales. Ladies and gentlemen, you can roll as much R as you like. Did you did you speak the language? Did you speak the language? He <laughs> was born. He was born there. Oh, oh, there we go. There we go. The, the, mind, the, the, the silence was a little deafening there, wasn't there? Um, I can say a selected word or two. Um, I shall not choose to do so today. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Cariad. Um, <laughs> if you've enjoyed this, like, subscribe. Write comments below. Um, thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you, as always. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. A pleasure, as always. Nice to be back in this second episode. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad he's keeping score. <laughs> For someone that thought he was talking about the enemy of the world, that's not bad going, is it? <laughs> Milton no. John is really good in this one. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you very much. Like, subscribe, and we shall see you all. Again.